Welcome to the Monroe Livingston Regional EMS System presentation on effective patient handoffs for EMS providers. This initiative, which engaged the region, EMS providers, and most importantly, our emergency department physician and nursing colleagues, is designed to provide a common process by which radio or phone reports, as well as bedside reports, can be given. The goal of any patient handoff is to relay information regarding EMS assessment and care of our pre-hospital patients to our physician and nursing colleagues. Communicating this information in a unified and effective manner will help to ensure the seamless transition as patient care continues. Effective handoffs are important to improve the continuity of care, reduce gaps in information transfer, enhance patient safety during the patient transfer process, and, let's face it, reduce frustration on the part of all those involved because no one likes to get only half the story. Many of us have played the telephone game, and unfortunately, sometimes our patient handoffs sound very similar. What is initially relayed by the provider ends up being only part of the information, or the wrong information when it gets to the receiver. Having a consistent communication tool to transfer information, and transferring that information when all members of the team can be present to hear it, is critical to reduce information loss. We know that handoffs are effective when they are standardized for all types of patients, not just the critical or stable ones, but all of them. Consistency breeds comfort and reproducibility. We also know that the most effective transfers of information occur when it is a direct communication from the provider taking care of the patient to the provider about to take care of the patient. And following a standard report, there are still opportunities for questions to be asked and to clarify information. So let's start at the end. Let's watch an example of an effective patient handoff of a patient having a myocardial infarction. Hey, uh, good morning, everybody. Dr. Nuro, how's it going? This is ALS patient running uh, ALS for acute coronary syndrome. And this is Dave, 70 years old. Woke up about 4.30 this morning out of um, um, a sound sleep with this crushing chest pain nausea and vomiting, um, pain radiating to his jaw and his uh, left arm. He's uh, EKG showed the inferior wall MI, so we came here right away. And he said two IVs, two nitroglycerin, and, and 324 of aspirin, current vital signs. His heart rate is uh, 110, still showing sinus in the monitor, uh, blood pressure 95 over 54, dropped after the second no. nitro. Uh, set in 96 percent. He looks skeptic around 30, 35. Uh, GCS is 15. Back, giving him a hard time to, to, to stay awake a little bit. Uh, any questions? I see the KG. Oh, okay. Yeah. Any medical problems? Uh, just diabetes and hypertension. Uh, no allergies. Any allergies? Any right sided meats? I did a right sided uh, before I showed no changes. They're all ready for you in cath lab. In this case of a STEMI, the provider used a standard report. This nine element report is the standardized EMS patient handoff report that improves information transfer, enhances patient safety, and reduces frustration. The first five points strive to identify the who, why, and when components of any communication. First, the provider identified the level of care provided, in this case, ALS. Next, the provider indicated the time EMS was requested. This is often very helpful information for the receiving providers to know. Third, the provider identified the reason transport occurred. In this case, it was quite obvious, but in others, it may be clear to the EMS crew, but not to the hospital staff that is receiving the patient. Here again is why a standard communication can help. The next two items are the simple demographics, the age and gender of the patient. The last four components are comprised of the missed mnemonic and strive to identify the what of the handoff communication. Let's look at each part of missed individually. The M of the missed mnemonic includes the mechanism or medical complaint. In the case of trauma, one would want to report the mechanism, whether that be a motor vehicle accident, the location in the vehicle, if it was a pedestrian struck at what speed, if it was blunt or penetrating injuries, the type of weapons used. If it was a medical complaint, we would want to know in brief the onset, the duration, or the history of that presentation. 
The I represents the injuries or the illness identified. Again, in the case of trauma, the injuries would be outlined generally from head to toe in terms of any pain, deformity, or injury patterns appreciated by the provider. In the case of an illness, any clinical indicators that are important, for example, findings of the 12 lead, a Cincinnati stroke scale, or other criteria specific to the illness that was identified by the provider. S refers to the signs and symptoms. The patient's initial and current complete set of vital signs, as well as the lowest confirmed blood pressure, any blood glucose determinations, a Glasgow Coma Scale score, or any other pertinent vital sign abnormalities should be reported at this time. The T represents any treatments provided, including any vascular access, the volume of fluids administered, any types of dressings or splints, any medications given and the response associated with that, and certainly if any defibrillation or pacing was provided. Using this nine element report, we can assure consistency for consistency is key to success. You probably already recognize that the only thing that may change slightly from one clinical presentation to another is the information included as part of the mechanism or medical complaint and injury or illness identified. For example, in STEMI, aspirin and nitrate administration and EKG findings are key. For stroke, the Cincinnati stroke scale and last time known well. For trauma, the mechanism, for a critically ill patient, what you suspect to be the cause. Importantly, we are using the same structure, and this structure is just as important for BLS providers as ALS providers, as the next example demonstrates. Okay, here comes our patient, everyone. Let's listen so we get a good report. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. This is Mr. Page. He called 911 at about 8.10 this morning, complaining of not feeling well. He requested transport to Highland Hospital for his illness. En route, he developed stroke symptoms and Highland was the closest stroke center, so we continued transport BLS instead of waiting for ALSs that would have delayed it. Um, he's a 60-year-old male that just after initiating transport became aphasic. He has right-sided pronator drift. The symptoms were witnessed by me and started at 845 and the stroke phone call was made just after that. He's Cincinnati uh, positive. He has right-sided pronator drift, speech was unable to be evaluated, and he has no facial deficits. He denied any dizziness, vision changes, headache, or difficulty moving prior to calling EMS. Um, his vital signs, pulse of 90, <coughs> blood pressure was 144 on 82, setting at 99%. Um, his respiration rates was 18, BG of 119, and we had no other interventions during transport. Do you have any questions? Can you confirm the time of onset again? It was 8.45 and it was witnessed by me. And was anyone with him this morning when all of this started? His wife was and she's out in the waiting room. Okay, thank you. Do we know if he's taking any blood thinning medications? No, he's not, no blood thinners. Cat scan is ready for you guys. All right, we'll head over. Let's all go, right, let's go. As you saw in this stroke case, Care was being rendered by a basic life support crew, and on patient handoff, they utilized the nine-line standard handoff tool. The BLS crew provided a good picture to the receiving hospital of why they were there, the time of symptom onset, and the associated symptoms, vital signs, and interventions provided. What we hope you have noticed in the two scenarios we have shown so far is that it is the same report, and it starts when the receiver and the giver of information is ready. This can be as obvious as the receiving nurse or physician asking you to go ahead with your report, or the EMS provider asking if everyone is present and ready for the report. The report starts when everyone is present and quiet, and the report comes from a single provider to reduce confusion and misinformation. Once the provider asks if there are questions, that is the signal that the report is complete and questions may be asked. Let's watch another example, in this case, of a patient with suspected sepsis. Good morning, guys. This morning. is our sepsis alert patient. So this is 65-year-old Lori. She's coming from a skilled nursing facility. because she's there for cardiac rehab for a mitral valve uh, replacement. So um, staff called us with altered mental status and probably a low BP. Um, we took it manually. It was 56 on 30, and heart it was about 100, and she is on beta blockers. 
So we uh, exposed a wound down here. She does have a pressure ulcer. Um, there was some green pus. We covered that back up. So we gave her two large bore IVs. She has two 14s in the AC. She's gotten 2,000 of, flu 2, of fluid. Uh, we started norepi, 10 mics a minute. And current vitals are heart rate of 110, BP is 95 on 54, SATs 96 on 4 liters, and respirators are 34. We have her on untitled, it was 50, um, BG is 220. Okay. Hi, Lori. This is Dr. Thompson. All right, we're going to be moving you over. Any questions for us, Dr. Yeah, did they give any labs from the nursing home? Yeah, they actually did. Uh, her white blood count was over 12,000, and her lactate was elevated as well. Okay, and a med list? Yep, I got a whole face sheet for you. I'll get you everything. All right. All right, Lori, let's move you over, okay? Certainly not all patients will come into the emergency department critically ill. However, this handoff report is ideal to give a picture of the patient's acuity to the triage nurse or physician. Such a report may be abridged or even abandoned any time an EMS provider has a critical intervention that requires immediate action such as sudden cardiac arrest, seizure, or loss of airway. The patient handoff report can then be communicated shortly thereafter, after the immediate life threat is mitigated. The reality is that such occurrences are extremely rare, and the vast majority of patient handoffs can occur as we have been demonstrating. The abridged triage report will also give the triage nurse an opportunity to understand the patient's presenting concern and quickly begin ascertaining the patient's needs. Although the nine item report does not include all the items triage nurses require for data entry, an abridged report provides a brief overview and then specific information such as medications, allergies, and so forth can be asked after that brief report is given. Again, the goal is to make sure that all members of the patient care team have an opportunity to share important information regarding the patient in a consistent manner. In most cases, after an abridged handoff report occurs at triage, a full handoff report may occur to a single nurse or physician. Here again, the process remains consistent where the nine item report is utilized. Let's watch an example of a single provider to a single nurse handoff. Hey Heather, how are you? Good, Heather, how are you? Not bad. Our patient was transferred to well, ALS for pain management. Okay. Around 10 o'clock this morning, he cut his arm on some broken glass and he was transported here at the family's request. Okay. This is Gavin, he's three years old. He has a three inch lap that will likely need sutures. Bleeding is currently controlled. Uh, most recent vitals are pulse 115, blood pressure 99 on 65, SAC 99, respiratory rate 24, GCS of 15, and he weighs about 20 kilos. We applied a pressure dressing and I gave him 40 micrograms of intranasal fentanyl in our relatively short trip. Okay. Overall, he's been doing good with you guys? Overall, he's been doing very well. All right, great. Let's get him over. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to take you out of the car seat now, okay? Just going to unbuckle this. There are several different reasons that pre-arrival notifications may be made for a patient. Additionally, there are several different routes by which those communications may be made. Each route has its own individual and unique components, and it is important that we understand those components to assure that communication is effective. Most important to recognize is that pre-arrival notifications are really a therapeutic intervention intended to prepare resources at the site of definitive care. Whether it is a stroke, STEMI, trauma, or critically ill patient, pre-notification makes a significant difference in making sure those resources are prepared for the patient's arrival. The pre-arrival notification should, whenever possible, be provided by the individual caring for the patient and utilizes the exact same nine-item report. Whenever possible, pre-notification should be provided at least 10 minutes prior to arrival. Pre-hospital therapeutic interventions should be coordinated and triaged to allow time for pre-notification, such as deferring IV placement in a stroke or acquiring a 12-lead EKG in a trauma patient. In both of those cases, the pre-notification has a greater therapeutic benefit than the IV or EKG and should take priority. It doesn't mean that those other items should not be done. It simply means that the order in which they are done is arranged to make sure that pre-notification is a priority. In the case of a pre-arrival notification, the provider should indicate their level of service, 
the ETA to the facility, and the reason for the call, whether it's a notification or a request for order, such as medication administration. Then the provider indicates the age and gender of the patient and provides a brief missed report. Pre-notification, particularly for critical patients, such as those shown on the screen, should be provided as soon as possible. For example, it may take 30 to 45 minutes at certain hours of the day to mobilize the cardiac catheterization team at a hospital, and so making the phone call before you leave the scene with the STEMI may very well get that coronary artery open sooner than waiting until you are 10 minutes out. Because pre-notification is a therapeutic intervention, you should prioritize it just like any other intervention. For example, if I have a choice of getting a second IV or making my pre-notification of a trauma patient, the pre-notification is a higher priority therapeutic intervention than the second or even third IV line, since definitive care for many critical patients is at the hospital. A communication center notification should only be a temporary measure while critical interventions are being addressed or if there are multiple patients on scene. If made, these notifications should occur as early as possible but only need to be made in the event that the provider is unable to call the receiving hospital themselves. EMS should still attempt to call the hospital via cellular prior to arrival and convey the patient's condition and any changes such as return of spontaneous circulation. If a supervisor or dispatcher is making pre-arrival notifications for a multi-patient incident, they should supply the hospital with the total number of patients and the number of patients by triage acuity whenever possible. However, each transporting unit should provide their own pre-notification when it is appropriate to do so based on their patient's clinical condition. In the very rare circumstance where a provider is unable to call the receiving hospital, only key information should be relayed by the supervisor or communication center to the emergency department. This includes the proximate age of the patient, their gender, and the reason for notification, such as trauma, respiratory arrest, or cardiac arrest. It also may be necessary to utilize this type of notification to request special resources that will be needed upon the ambulance's arrival, such as help lifting for bariatric patients or security due to a law enforcement issue. However, whenever possible, the transporting unit should call, as I hope we have identified through this presentation how critical pre-notification is and how it must be prioritized like any other therapeutic intervention. So let's take a listen to an effective pre-notification. Strong Medic Control Communication Nurse Loretta speaking. Is this a medical or a trauma patient? It's a trauma patient. Okay. Uh, this is Frank Hanzo with Henrietta Ambulance Paramedics. Uh, coming in ALS to your facility, about 15 minutes out on board, I have a 28-year-old male patient who was riding an ETV, unknown speed, uh, collided with a deer and was thrown from the vehicle. Uh, we're suspecting a uh, acute abdominal injury. He's complaining of belly pain initially. He has a firm and distended abdomen. He was tachycardic into the 130s, hypotensive with the lowest confirmed blood pressure, was 78 on 30. His current vitals are false of 124, Thank PCD you. on 46. Uh, fat 98%. He's being bagged at 14. His GCS is 111. Uh, he received a saline bolus initially based on his hypotension. He was intubated for declining GCS and inability to protect his airway, and he's received a total of 200 mics of fentanyl so far. Uh, and we'll be to you in about 15 minutes. Do you have any other questions? Will you just repeat the second blood pressure for me? The second blood, the current blood pressure is 88 on 46. 88 on 46, and you're 15 minutes out? Correct. All right, very good. We'll see you when you get here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Based on the pre-notification, the hospital readies its resources for a serious trauma patient. Let's now look at the bedside handoff of this trauma patient. All right, looks like our patient's coming in. Everyone quiet down. Hi, guys. Hi. All right, everybody ready? Yep. So fire department's dispatched at 1900 and requested ALS shortly thereafter. Uh, we've been with our patient for 40 minutes. He was transported here based on the CDC trauma triage guidelines. We have a 28-year-old male was wearing a, or not wearing a helmet on an ATV. He hit a deer. It was thrown 10 feet from the vehicle. We're suspecting acute abdominal injury. He was complaining of belly pain. Initially presented to us confused with a GCS of 446, but quickly decompensated. He was found to be tachycardic up until the 130s. 
with our lowest confirmed blood pressure being 78 on 30. Uh, most recent vitals, we currently have pulse of 124, BP of 88 on 46, his SAT's 99%, he's being bagged at about 14 times a minute, his end title's 37, his GCS is 111. Uh, on the way here, he got a liter of fluid. When his mental status decompensated, we intubated him. Uh, he's intubated with an 802, but it's 24 at the teeth. Uh, we have good end title waveform, and the patient received about 200 mics of fentanyl on the way here. Uh, any questions? Uh, any other injuries? Uh, the, the fire department put a teapot on his pelvis. They suspected a pelvic fracture. Okay. Did you get any paralytics for intubation? He did not get any paralytics. Do you know if family's on the way? Uh, I do not know. So what was the BG with you? His BG was 148. Any other questions? No. Okay, let's get ready to move on. In this training, we discuss the need for improved patient handoffs and discuss the goals of a uniform patient handoff, whether this is at the bedside or over the phone. We identify the key patient information that should be conveyed during any patient handoff, which are outlined in the nine element report shown on the screen. The level of care provided, the time of 911 request or ETA to the hospital in case of a pre-notification, the reason for notification or transport, the patient's age and gender, and the missed report, the mechanism or medical complaint, the injuries or illnesses identified, the signs and symptoms, and the treatments provided. This initiative to provide a common patient handoff process for all of our patients across all of our providers requires everyone to recognize and appreciate the culture change we are looking to embrace. This will take time for all of our partners, the EMS community, physicians, nurses, and allied health providers whom we interact with every day. But in the end, we will have a safe and hopefully less frustrating system to allow us to perform at our best. Thank you for watching this presentation on effective patient handoffs and our appreciation to the leadership of all area hospitals for the input and support on this collaborative effort to improve the care we provide our patients. We hope you incorporate this paradigm into your practice right away.